We are back. It's me. And it is all surprise, everyone. We weren't sure yesterday uh, <laughs> at the end of the day when you were leaving if you're going to be joining me today. And I'm so glad that you are back. How are you doing today? Man, I'm completely stoked to be here. We had some fun casting couple of games for the CCG squad who started looking a whole lot better by the end of the day. I'm looking forward to seeing the continued ascension of this squad here. I'm, I'm sincerely at the point after yesterday's game, um, after how yesterday's game ended against Tempest Gaming, I, I'm like, I'm like, I've got blood pressure pills ready. I'm like ready for the ups and downs of this ride that we are going to be taking on by CCG because, uh, you know, I said it yesterday and let's talk about that, right? Cause we're, we're, this is NACL summer 2023, the qualifier. It's the first one of the summer now. Um, and we've seen one day so far and there was a lot of things that were pretty expected. I would say when it came to the top, the top seeded teams, right? The teams that we're really familiar with, with players that have been around, uh, see a little proving grounds, things like that for a long time. So uh, let's talk about first CCG's games. And then also let's kind of delve into maybe something, that, some stuff that was unexpected. So to start things out, game number one for CCG yesterday um, didn't go so great. It was against the Beagle Brothers uh, and it started out relatively well. But can you kind of walk us through, I guess, how that one worked out? Yeah, that was really an unfortunate match for CCG. They had a very early game draft with the Olaf, with the Wukong, with the Lushanami in the bot, game, bot lane, rather. And unfortunately for CCG, they just didn't do a good job of getting that early pressure down. Lunar and Veruto really didn't get the pressure they needed. They couldn't get onto the Beagle Brothers bot lane. And by the time they really started affecting the game at all, it was a little bit too late. Shocky in the top lane who was doing a good job wasn't enough to carry. And the Beagle Brothers just took advantage of being a little bit higher level, having that scaling advantage and just rolled over CCG. Yeah, I, you know, you never want to say that the team gets rolled over, but that's, that's kind of how it went. Now, um, let's talk about game two. <laughs> game two was a... Uh... <laughs> It was a heck of a ride there, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, I mean, game, so game two, I I legit, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. You know, I, I'm doing the CCG broadcast, right? I'm, I'm rooting for CCG. Up until the last 30 seconds of the game, the entire time through my mind, I was like, we're losing this. CCG's losing this. There's no way. You know, things started to kind of look up. And then it, it took a big dive back down, kind of look up, big dive back down. But there was a Gwen and uh, Shockey. Oh my God, Shockey was our MVP of the day. I, I think I don't even have to ask you that question really to confirm it. Uh, so, so you want to uh, talk about talk about Shockey's adventures on Gwen? Oh, Shockey <laughs> all over the place on that map. There was really. All of the pressure was on Shockey to take that game as it felt like nowhere else on the map was doing anything but Shockey being able to get split push pressure even as they were seeding objectives, being able to find the engages and in that last fight being able to just distract the enemy team long enough that Lunar could finally step up and start DPSing, which is something that he hadn't been able to do in any fights, was what barely allowed CCG to turn that around. And it was a couple of really, really close fights that they had to salvage there to bring that win back. It was a couple of close fights. And I will say it, it wasn't, it, it, Shockey did such a good do job distracting. It wasn't even just the last fight. It was like three fights in a row where they sent one member back to base to protect, you know, some of the Nexus turrets and they continued to fight up in the top lane. So it's worked out really well for CCG. We're going to have to see how things work out today. And I think actually draft is ready here for our game number one. And uh, we're going to get to see a lot, a lot more new faces here. Oh, yeah, that's right. Are. That's right. Wait, hold on real quick. I didn't actually mean to make a job for somebody yesterday. I made a joke about there being graphics today and about oh i made a job for someone and uh, we have incredible people over at ccg so there are actually things made uh kelda has stepped up and we got a head-to-head -head graphic let's, let's pull the head-to-head -head graphic oh it's gorgeous i need i need to see actually do we have the stream through uh through discord <laughs> <laughs> all right there, there we I go want, i need to see the graphic oh oh it's gorgeous it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. oh my god ccg is going to be starting on the blue side here habit gaming is going to be starting on the red side and let's 
uh, yeah, we got the draft in 30 seconds. So let's take a quick look as well at uh, how Havoc did yesterday. Do you have that pulled up? Yeah, so Havoc Sick. did go <laughs> one and one, just like CCG. They had a win in round one versus the Cheese Chasers. That was the upset just above CCG, knocking down the seven seed, and a loss versus Mirage in round two. In both games, though, Uni 13, the top laner for Havoc Gaming, absolutely popped off, looked great. So this matchup in the top lane, CCG carry versus Havoc carry is going to be real interesting to watch. I love it. Thank you so much. I just took my dog on a walk and I literally showed up like two minutes before the broadcast started. So I appreciate you having your notes ready. <laughs> so as we are, we should be hopping into draft any moment now. Uh, we got three games today too. That's the other exciting thing. Yesterday we started with just two games. So there was the opportunity for just a comeback basically. But CCG now has uh, the chance to not just come back, but also potentially take a 2-1 day, a 3-0 day. Or, you know, the unfortunate side of is is the flip of that, which we just want to Well, we, we don't talk about those. Yeah, we not, just want to discuss. Important. Not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Until it until it comes to fruition, I'm gonna leave it off the table here. So let's see. I think everybody is ready for the draft here. We've got a uh, Unicross, Flocon, Wabe, and let's take a look. How is Glazer. it that I can remember? How is it that I can remember four and not the fifth? <laughs> Is Glazer in support for Havoc? Glazer in support. Um, where are you? Where are you keeping your eyes, at least for the early parts of the game here for CCG? Where do you want to see them excel um, so that they do better than game one yesterday? I, we've talked about Shockey a lot. Shockey's had a lot of pressure on them, as had has Munchie in the jungle. But with this highly volatile top lane, where both of these players like playing things that can really blow the map open, I really need to see Munchie put Shockey on top here. Because if they can control Uni, it seems like that's going to be the win condition for keeping Havoc out of this game. Well, and we want to keep Havoc out of the game. <laughs> we want to let CCG get in there because um, it has felt like kind of a slow ramp, right, for CCG. With this current meta, we're used to slow ramping games or we're used to kind of, you know, the snowballing games. It's a lot less frequent than it used to be because I think Riot has done a really good job of balancing the game out. Uh, but I want to see CCG start things off like hot and heavy. We haven't really gotten that chance in, in any uh, in, in any lane. Uh, and I, I think for me personally, I want to see Rain pop off. I think Rain did a really good job yesterday. Rain had some incredible charms in the Ari, but we didn't really get to see the opportunity for them to, to to have some amazing plays, to do some hard carry plays. I know that they have it in them. So that's something that I am looking forward to as well is, uh, you know, seeing Rain maybe get the opportunity to have counter picks. And maybe, okay, that's another one. Counter picks. We didn't really talk about this yesterday, but the only one on CCG that was actually really counter picking was Shock Eels. Yeah, and I mean, you have to agree with that on some extent. This is your carry. This is the guy that you want to support. But Shocky has proven that they can play perfectly fine. I think it's probably time, as you said, to move some of those counter picks down to players that need a little bit more support. In this case, probably Rain, as with the bot lane being so important here, we normally see that at least somewhat touched in the first rotation. So Lunar likely won't have a chance there. Oh, uh, yeah. Speaking of the first rotation. Oh. Okay, well, I was like, I'm not missing something here, am I? Cool. We're just waiting on the no. check, making sure that everybody's good to go. And there we go. Instantly, we start knocking out our first round of bands. We got the Vi, we got the Nico on the opposite side. It's a very quick Rengar ban once again. <laughs> yeah, just whittling down that jungle pool a little bit. The Nico has been very flexible recently, so not a surprise that that's been taken out here. I am going to be looking to see if havoc tries to ban out anything from shocky the olaf will likely be up for contention as that's the champion that havoc played most well on so if it doesn't get taken away in bans here i would almost wonder if ccg would be willing to blue on that yeah i mean at the end of the day olaf i think is one of the best and safest picks in terms of early blue right now uh, and it's banned and yep uh it's banned by ccg so you know i guess you're reading their minds but the opposite. <laughs> so we'll have to see. Yeah. yeah, right. Where Havoc focus is there. You know, I love Havoc's logo. I swear, I, I, every time I look at it, I just think I'm looking at a casino in Las Vegas or something. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. The or the Civ Five logo, so really. Fancy. I, yeah, it's so fancy. Shows how much time I spend online. <laughs> 
And they do see a Cassante first lock. A as we mentioned in game two, I believe it was, this Cassante could technically be going to rain here. So it's a decent flex pick, gonna keep Havoc on their toes a little bit. I mean, we saw we saw Tempest run the Cassante mid too. Um, so that's one that you've got the flexibility of it. We don't really expect to see Cassante mid, um, but that that is that's always a chance. Again, it was Tempest that ran that yesterday, so I'm not certain if that's how it's going to run through. Havoc on the other side has focused on their bottom lane, right? So we got the Lucian, and we have the Melio. And uh, the Lucian we saw CCG pick up yesterday, and it did not work very well. That was game number one here, so Lunar had to hold back really far. Looks like uh, CCG is going to continue, kind of like in game number two, to focus towards a little bit of the later game, right? If Elios, you're looking at the scaling, the hard scaling. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of support is going to go along this with this, and if they're going to lock that in instantly. I definitely suggest locking in a counter, uh, and that's exactly what CCG is doing here. I like it. Yeah, the Lucian Milio is very aggressive in the early game, but is fairly short range. With the Aphelio Senna, you can keep them at arm's length and allow yourself time to scale up. And as we saw in day number one with CCG, we're not seeing a lot of aggression out of this bot lane before they get out of the lane phase. So something like this, where they'll be able to stay safe and scale up and slowly build that pressure, really seems to play into their strengths here. So I like this for CCG. I like it a lot. And we didn't see this, honestly, at all yesterday. We just saw them kind of picking for a first round um, power picks. Granted, CCG was on the red side for both games yesterday. So we might start to see really the differences in their, their picks uh, when they do start on blue side here. But uh, this is also kind of the opportunity, right, for these teams to really feel each other out. This is the first encounter that we have on the actual broadcast for this, this summer qualifier. Um, so it's kind of, you know, testing the waters as well. We got the mid lane lock in as opposed to, uh, you know, a potential top or mid. I think, you know, that that, that understanding that that Cassante may be a flex is known here by Havoc. So, Viego and Syndra are the first two bands. Syndra, um, we saw Rain do a pretty good job on Syndra in game number one yesterday. Yeah. I think as well, they're trying to keep Flocon a little bit safe here with some of these bands, with the Silas, with the Syndra. Flocon, through two games, has only played the Lissandra. And in game one, they went 1-4-22. and 22. So very supportive, very much helping their team to advance. In game two, was a little bit more unfortunate going 0-5-0. and 0. So perhaps this Havoc team looking to protect them will be banning out a few of the champions that Flocon's not as comfortable playing into and perhaps we might see Cross playing around them a little bit more trying to help Flocon survive a little bit here in the mid lane. So those stats that you just gave so Flocon out of the two games didn't have a positive game is what you're saying and and either way uh, was no, no, didn't no, have no, no. A... Well no no I'm saying I'm yeah. sorry positive KDA. Yeah, I mean game 1 was perfectly fine. It was yeah. the uni show. So <laughs> Flocon was I'm just a, talking was a support. Stats, bro. I'm just talking numbers. <laughs> Black and white numbers, baby. Rain's doing better, all right? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> there we go, there we go. All right, we're at an understanding here. I'm, I'm boosting CCG, all right? Come on. <laughs> no, I got you, I got you. Knock down the, the opposition a little bit in, in able, uh, to be able to do that, and I love it. I love that Rain is on somebody like the Ori. We saw the Ari uh, uh, picked up by Rain yesterday. And I, again, I think they did a really good job. They didn't really have the chance to pop off. They didn't have early jungle support. Munchie was just kind of all over the place, to be honest. Uh, but Munchie might be falling back to the same thing that we saw him on two times. And actually, it was really early pick in, in yesterday's games. But we are hovering on that Wukong that worked out really well game number two. So that's going to be the lock in another kind of aggressive early game for the top, more towards the top side of the map and then looking towards that later game. So I wouldn't be surprised if, again, we just didn't see Munchie, you know, make many big moves to the bottom side of the map, unless it's responding to Havoc. Yeah, and given the draft, it's not surprising. And given the way these players play, it's not yeah. surprising. Lunar and Brudo mm -hmm. like to play passive, like to just survive. So if you can focus elsewhere and get the guys ahead that want to be ahead, you're perfectly fine. That being said, Uni is picking up the Darius. Uh, because why not? If you're going to carry, might as well go all in on the I am the carry mentality here. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, you know, they, they've got a, a really good amount of damage here for Havoc, right? Uh, I'm curious to see 
how this trundle is going to facilitate right the, the additional damage my expectation is honestly that we're going to see cross uh er invade early early not invade but sorry uh provide a gank you know show up in one of these lanes because at the end of the day for how much damage to cross the map here he can just show up throw a pillar out and be like all right peace that's your kill i'll see you next time yeah absolutely um and if uni gets ahead if cross is able to get that pressure i mean ccg they have some good disengage with rain with Verudo on the senna but it's still a darius a decimate into noxie and guillotine is going to decimate that back line and shaki and Verudo, or shaki and munchie rather may not be able to carry with just the tanky boys yeah it's gonna be tough and it's gonna be a slow game but ccg is more than okay with that right when it comes to the later game they have it they also have like i said that that, that you know they have some of that early damage right munchie is going to be able to provide that rain is going to be able to be able to provide a lot of the beginning but going up against flocon on lissandra especially expecting this to be a very comfortable champion for him uh we're gonna have to see how things work out i think you know at, at this point i think that we are safe to uh to actually since it's the start of the day give ourselves a little bit of a rest in this one uh i think we might take a quick break as we are loading into the game is that okay production you're the best, Gurf. You're the All best. Right. All right. We are going to take a very quick break. When we get back, we're just going to hop right back in the game. That way you guys don't have to listen to us just babble uh, until we get in the game. So <laughs> we will be right back. You don't want to miss this one. Game one out of three for the day. CCG versus Havoc. And we're in a game. Game number one out of three today. It is us of CCG versus Havoc. We are trying to work with, uh, you know, these frame rate issues, but you know what? Any game is better than no game. So we're going to at least get it to you now. And if we find a workaround, we'll probably try to implement that here in a little bit. Yeah, but in the meantime, we can still enjoy all the action we can get. Oh, and yeah. a little bit early, as looks like Havoc can't quite clear that ward, so that's 30 gold that won't be in their pockets. Ha ha ha, 30 gold you don't get. That's almost half a ward. <laughs> hey, that's the yeah. better part of a health potion. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's more than a half a health potion. I like that. I exactly. like that stat better than almost half a ward. <laughs> um, pretty standard starts here. It is going to be... Um, Again, we are CCG on the blue side here. Havoc Gaming is on the red side. And uh, I think if I don't see, if I don't see Munchie here um, really push in for some early aggression, I'm going to finally request that he move from the Wukong, I think. I think this is like a trial for me. This is like, all right, Munchie, show us what you got. This is the third game in a row that you have selected this Wukong. One of them, it did not go well. One of them, it went quite well. Um, so we'll have to see how he actually plays through it on this game three and why he's so committed to this Wukong, aside from the amazing engagements. Yeah, I mean, Wukong obviously is very powerful in terms of helping to disrupt the enemy team, especially when you have other carries like the Orianna on top here. So in terms of raw team composition, I definitely understand it, but you'd think that by the third time of playing it in a two-day span, the enemy teams would start to know what you're going to do with it. So, as you said, I think it might be time, whether or not this game goes well, for Munchie to explore alternative options. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I do appreciate when a player, like, like holds the... Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe he's just holding cards in his hand. It's not like, oh, he really just thinks he's the best at this Wukong. He's like, nah, nah, nah. I'm just going to play the Wukong until I need to pull out the big guns. <laughs> but we don't know. We get to see the development of this team, which is really exciting. It's my favorite part of the starts of these new splits, and particularly this one, because there are so many new faces that we get to see. Uh, and and I, this is another team here in terms of Havoc Gaming, which is not, you know, on the top side of the, the bracket there or seating. And so it's a lot of new faces for me. Yeah, that being said, we are starting to see some of the regular trends that we would expect uh, in round two. Most of the higher ranked teams did get the wins we expected from them. So perhaps starting to settle out a little bit here, but right in the middle where CCG is, is where we're seeing a whole lot of action with these Ooh. new folks. It's been a whole lot of fun to see new names. Ooh, look at all that damage on a Glazer. Nothing you can do about that one. And this is exactly what you were talking about. The Lucian Melio, right? It's a really strong bottom lane. They've got some good early damage, but it's very close range. When it comes to Lunar and particularly the Senna, they have 
access on that one. Cross making his way down towards the bottom. You can see that Flocon was actually following him down to try to make a move if Wukong and uh, maybe the Oriana here, Rain, tried to push a pinch. That wasn't the case. So I like they're being a little bit cheeky, but they're also not pushing their luck quite yet here, Alls. Yeah, and with uh, Sege Webe and Glazer pushed deep in under the turret as well, Lunar and Veruto had the ability to roam. So that would have been a 4v2 in the jungle. So very smart of Cross and Flocon to not overstep their luck there. Just a little bit of harassment, just trying to keep Munchie off the off the tempo that he likes being on. Yep, and uh, that, that tempo, I'm still trying to learn. <laughs> that tempo, uh, you know, it's, it's, got, it's got its changes. It does look like he, instead of, you know, focusing on trying to harass, instead of focusing on even potential invades, uh, this time, it's actually Havoc on the other side that is is doing the same thing, and they're going to run that one back. <laughs> actually, they're going to try to navigate down again. We can see the Trundle actually making his way towards the Tribush on this bottom side of the map. Yeah, this is unwarded. Lunar will find it with a walk back. However, the pillar is there, so that's going to force a flash. Yes, this is a very safe lane, but it's immobile. So that's going to be expensive, and they're going to have to be very, very careful here in the near future. I didn't even actually see, but so Sege Wobe, this is, this is, we were told this is how you say it. It's not Sege Wobe. Sage Wobe. It's Sege. No, I'm pretty. Sege? I thought it was Sege Wobe. We have it. We have we it. We'll get confirmation we it, at yeah, some we, point we here. We will. We have it written down. Either way, one of us is saying it right, and it's Sege. Sege Webe. All right. You know, um, either way, it's it doesn't look like it looks. Or it doesn't sound like it looks. <laughs> um, Lucian. Yeah, like, yeah, you know what? We're just going to go with that at the end of the day. Also, uh, the Wukong, I know we've been kind of talking about this. For those of you that don't know, that is Munchie. Uh, and then in the mid lane there, all of those numbers that I'm not going to say again, that is Rain. So we're just going to be calling them by the easier names to say here. That being said, despite all of this harassment that we've seen from Cross in the jungle, Munchie does still have a small CS lead thanks to being able to absorb that pressure to Cross not being able to step in as much as they would like without the lane support. Munchie has been able to pretty well stabilize it. That being said though, it does look like Trundle is going to be trying to take this early Infernal Drake, starting to get some scaling there. And with the CCG team liking to play towards the late game, having an insurance policy like this will be very nice for Havoc. Yeah, and, you know, once we get to the <clears throat> team fight stage, I think that, you know, CCG is looking really clean on that. It feels like this composition was, you know, designed around that. And I feel like the Wukong is the final pick here. They've got the Oriana. They're like, all right, we, we might not have, like, a bounce house situation, but we do kind of have a little bit of a trampoline, right? <laughs> kind of popping people up all over the place. If you get the Shockwave, then you get the Cyclone, or even Cyclone, Shockwave, Cyclone, right? You're just kind of throwing these members all over the place, but keeping them exactly where you want so that Lunar is able to get as much damage down and Shocky is able to engage on this fight. So it makes sense as well that CCG is taking this one pretty slowly. And actually, speaking of slow, it's going to be an engage on the bottom side. It's perfect timing from Munchie to try to engage on this one. But Havoc very quickly recognizes things and has to burn four summoner spells to get out. Yeah, that's an expensive disengage. However, they did get Lunar fairly low, so might be looking for that. That being said, Glazer is lower level here, so they have to be a little bit careful. Munchie's showing himself as well. Just really wants to put this pressure down, give Lunar and Baruto a chance to get out of this lane, get some buys down, it looks like. Get some buys down. Uh, Lunar's doing a great job in terms of CS here. We can see that 17 is that's that's a, a pretty decent advantage right it's not insurmountable it's definitely you're not looking at seven and a half minutes in the game and saying oh god they're insanely ahead of me right it's not a full item it's nothing like that but when you've got the coal already stacking here for lunar uh you got full boots now being picked up this is going to be huge for them to be able to be really sticky on this bottom lane and if they are able to get uh you know a bit of crowd control down get that w from the Senna to get a, a lock in, it's a pretty good chance for them to just continue to make Sage Wabe's life uh, pretty miserable here in this bottom lane. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see Cross show up more frequently there, but I gotta commend Munchie for being in the perfect place at the perfect time on that one. Yeah, Munchie doing a better job here on the Wukong, having that pressure that we needed to see elsewhere on the map. The fact that this game is not going poorly is an absolute win for CCG. <laughs> it's a it's Darius, true. it's a Lucian Milio. You would expect them to be 
absolutely slamming in their respective lanes. But it's even. We have no kills on the board through eight and a half minutes. Yep. And, you know, that's... um. Similar to game number one, it was a really, really slow start. CCG, like I said, just kind of feeling feeling things out. Uh, you know, not playing too patiently or not playing in a scared manner, but just kind of moving forward with a little bit of trepidation, which is really what you want to see, especially at the start of these qualifiers. Um, like I said, when you're feeling out your opponents. So trying to make moves once again towards the top side. We've got tons of pings coming out from Havoc here. We know that Cross is in the wings, but also we did just see, or they did just see, Munchie as well. It's going to be a three-man jump. Shocky's going to flash away, and it's a flash here in response. Two flashes, actually. But that first blood is going to go over to Havoc, and it's going to be Uni that picks it up. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. I'm wondering what was going through Shockey's head there because they saw that Cross and Glazer were in the area. There was so much fighting around this Rift Herald. And just not respecting that they could still be in the area, having no wards down and no escape plan just leaves you so vulnerable, even on something as tanky, as defensive as the Cassante here. So that does put Uni in a great spot. Now a little bit ahead, now having some pressure with a couple of turret plates in their pocket as well is going to have a significant advantage once they get this back off. Uh, when we're looking at these summer spells too, it's been Havoc, you know, has been burning a lot of these and and actually both teams have been burning a lot and it has resulted, like we were talking about, in just this one kill. That Infernal Drake was picked up as well uh, by Havoc. So it, it is now kind of an opportunity here with more summer spells being down on the side of Havoc for CCG to continue to pressure this. But I'm loving how the recognition has come through by Lunar and Baruto here to say, all right, we've got the pressure, we're ahead. We have this confident play style. Uh, Sagawabe and Glazer aren't really able to do anything to retaliate here. So all we have to do is play it safe, keep an eye on Cross and continue to ensure that our Wukong is kind of within a stone's throw. And they're doing a great job on that. Already back down, Munchie goes back down to that tri bush just to take care of things in case there is a bit of a retaliation since we're not exactly sure where Cross is. Yeah, they're doing a great job. And this is this is wonderful for CCG, right? As the very scaling lane to be ahead like this, to have a 15 CS lead, to have a nearly fully stacked Cole, to have all this pressure and not even really needing Munchie to be wait on the scales here the entire time yes munchie's in the area and if there's an opportunity munchie will be there but munchie doesn't have to be at every moment this is going to be a very big power point for ccg especially if lunar can do what they were doing towards the end of game two yesterday and start <laughs> being a carry for the ccg squad that being said we are seeing the rift herald drop and we are seeing havoc rotate towards the second drake ccg knows about this but this is going to be a man down a fight until Shocky gets there. So this is a little bit dangerous to move in. And there were lots of pings coming out uh, right there from Havoc in the mid lane saying, Shocky's on his way down. We we don't want to commit to this. We don't know exactly how much Shocky can do just yet. He do have, you know, he's 1-0 and, or he's, sorry, 0-1 oh, and 0, oh, but at the end of the day, he's still a Cassante and you still have to be worried about that early damage. Cross positioning potentially to try to retaliate here. Baruto taking the long haul across to support here the jungle, trying to take out some of that vision. There's the blast cone. It's only one member that comes through on it, though. Lunar's able to do a lot of damage on the backside. Out comes the Cyclone, but oh no, it's just too much damage on to Havoc. He ends, or on to Munchie, he ends up going down and Havoc finds themselves another. Yeah, it's really hard to punch through a trundle in the early game with subjugate offers so much healing there and taking away those resistances allowed munchie even through the passive to be punched down just a little bit of overaggression and flow con being able to rotate down as well is great for havoc so again close fight ccg five ten minutes from now they take that fight they'll get three four kills out of it but they're still early. They're a scaling comp, and they need to respect that a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, you know, at, at 13 minutes in, 0-2, certainly not huge. We're looking at less than 1,000 gold differential between the two. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and yes, the kills are on pretty good members here for Havoc, but honestly, at the end of the day, pretty much anybody aside from the support getting kills is going to be going in Havoc's way for the early part of the game. But like you mentioned, you know, the later things go, the better things are going to be looking for CCG, this team fight stage. I'm really excited to see. Wow, how comes the ultimate here from Uni13? There is the ghost that gets popped. Shocky is trying to pull them back so that Munch.
punch. She can get in on the fight, and that is all that's necessary. Beautiful timing, and everything that I wanted to see out of Munchie, he has been giving today. Yeah, great job by Munchie responding to the fight there in the top lane. I'm also very surprised by that early Noxian guillotine from Uni13. Seemed yeah. a little bit aggressive there, and what was oh, that was what allowed Shaki to really be confident about their ability to stay alive for that long. Really great look by the top laner there, helping to rebalance that lane a little bit. That being said, we are seeing some more plates being taken here before the end of the game. Looks like the final score in terms of plates is going to be 6-4, to four, which is bad. But the gold for Havoc is in all the right places. Three plates on to Uni13 and three plates down here in the bot lane. Oh. Where they are looking for an engage. The flash oh. shockwave doesn't hit. Oh, oh man. It's rough. It's a teleport, it's a flash, and it's a shockwave invested. And shockwave, of course, isn't, you know, it's not an incredibly long cooldown, but um, that teleport just came in a little bit too late. You could tell uh, we saw that there was a ward in the bush. So uh, really, really good placement on that one coming out of Havoc. If that ward hadn't been there, absolutely could have been a completely different story. Rudo now taking a bit of a barrage, but that allows Rudo to continue on in this. When the ultimate comes out, he's going to be able to pick up one, the flash forward, but now there's a teleport in and crosses on his way, so they need to get the heck out of dodge. The cooling comes out, but Sagewabe is not going to go down. Flocon almost losing his life in that, but it's two down on the side here for Havoc. Yeah, the teleport down by the Oriana is unfortunate, or the lack of teleport by the Oriana yeah. is unfortunate, having used it in the earlier play, allowed Flocon to roam without a whole lot of response there. Munchie was in the area as well, but couldn't come down in time, and with those low health bars from Havoc, if there had been even one more member in the area, they could have picked up a couple of kills to turn that around and keep this game a little bit closer in their pocket, but that being said, they're only down two kills. They're only down 1,500. They've only lost one turret so far. So if they can keep scaling up, keep playing this carefully, they should be in an all yeah. right spot. It's, I mean, at this point, I can't ever say that CCG's down and out. Like, I can't ever say that it's over because, again, going through my mind, we yesterday, the entire game, that is, that is exactly the perception that I had, and I had to eat my words uh, because the game was ended very quickly, and, and it was the side lane pressure from Shockey, right, that was so consistent that ended up resulting in that win. Uh, but now for CCG, you need to start looking at trying to get to that, that later game stage, trying to get to the team fight stage. And unfortunately for CCG, Havoc is the team that's really pushing forward for that. Now, Shockey's in a really dangerous place. It's three members. The pillar's going to hit. He's going to get the flash over. And that means that four members are on the top side. And they're not going to be able to pick up the kill. But they do manage to grab that tower. And they are going to continue to put some pressure here to get another charge off of this Red Carol. Yeah, CCG not choosing to respond to this very rapidly. Ooh. Only now are Munchie and Berudo coming in. This is still four members. They still have the Rift Herald. Oh. So they're going to start breaking into this inhibitor turret. However, Uni13 is caught on the back side of this. Rain is rotating in. They might be able to pick up something on the back side. Mm, doesn't look like the Flash Ghost is enough. Oof. Doesn't look like it. And uh, yeah, Flash Ghost has gone out for Uni, but totally worth it absolutely worth it for havoc there they were able to push down 100%. two towers and then they were able to get the charge off two separate times three separate times right and be able to now really put pressure on shocky who again in the previous games or at least yesterday's games was really the saving grace of the team for ccg now we've got the engage here the teleport coming through from shocky as he tries to restart this one you have munchie needing to back away from this dragon but shocky he's convinced that he's going to be able to do something he tried to at least give some space to the rest of the team to maybe continue and take down this dragon and no havoc is going to be able to pick up the kill on him and and also snag that second break for themselves. Yeah, that's unfortunate there, Shocky. TPing into the center of the fight. Just not quite tanky enough to absorb all of that just yet. Flocon, first game we've really seen them step up for Havoc, able to lock Shocky down very, very, very effectively there. So the Cassante not able to do a whole lot. And that will be a Drake lost. However, it is just a Cloud Drake which will be nice in rotation for Havoc, but not necessarily quite as directly impactful as some of the other stat-giving dragons that we see on the Rift from time to time. Yeah. I, you know, I want to talk about, let's, uh, I, already, I already mentioned objectives. Haven't really been the focus here for CCG. That hasn't been condemning for them in the past, but let's look at the vision. Um, 
That, that's a lot of red wards. That's a lot, a lot of red wards. Really aggressive, covering the entire... Oh, thank you so much, Gary. Covering the entire river right there. And and again, we've got pretty much this try, these three points, right? Almost in the five-point start. Uh, and there's nothing when it comes to this fog of war that we're seeing for CCG. They have to be so dang careful in how they move forward. And and even in that sense, Havoc is like, all right, we control the top side. Let's continue to layer more down. Yeah, thankfully for CCG, it's not completely disastrous yet. We're not seeing the wards pushing deep into the jungle. We're not seeing them at those secondary or tertiary openings down deep into CCG's own lanes here, but still the control here, the fact that CCG can't really safely walk into any point in the river, they can't walk up like Shockey's doing without a whole lot of support, means that Havoc has control, is able to split push very freely. We see how unworried Uni13 is on the top side because he knows when Shockey will be back, he knows where everybody on the map is, he knows his exits are covered. Havoc really good control over the map right now and we need to see ccg step up here yeah uh, you know at least at least for ccg we got we got rain ahead on cs right i'm gonna take all these little wins because it's almost it's almost 30 cs in advantage of course the opposite side of that is locon has already gotten two kills and two assists so it's sitting really pretty in terms of those stats uh but you know the, the lucian hasn't gotten fed lucian's 0 and 4 right we're talking about one kill on lunar so i'm really hoping to also see lunar get the chance to make some big moves here because yesterday uh we didn't really see lunar pop off until the very end where lunar was able to step forward make some really good positioning calls and actually i mean end up making kind of a push play that inevitably yes with the help of the rest of the team won the game um, but that's a really good sign for this one. Lunar hasn't been focused down. That was what CCG was experiencing a lot yesterday, is a lot of pressure towards the bottom side of the map. So now that you don't have a really set back Lunar, we have the chance to see where this could go uh, in terms of early scaling. Yeah, and at the end of the day, he's still very close to Sege Webe. Oh, yeah. Only about half an item down. And if you have to choose between a four item Aphelios or a four and a half item Lucian, I think most people would choose the Aphelios every single time. At the late game, Aphelios is much more powerful. So, pound for pound, dollar for dollar, the bot lane of CCG is in a great spot and could be the major carry here. There just needs to be enough space bought by Shockey to let Lunar do that. And right now, Shockey is far enough behind that can't, he can't really do that just yet. Needs to get a little bit more tanky first. Yeah. Yeah. At the 21 minute mark, right, it's not, you're not feeling incredibly comfortable. Two items, right, is where you're, you're starting to feel a little bit better. Shocky cannot get out of this one. This is a situation where you just have to let it happen. We even saw the teleport come through out of rain. The culling comes out on the backside. That's going to be now Munchie, who's the target. It's up to Berudo and Lunar to escape, but they're running into the enemy jungle, and there's so much speed on the side of Havoc. They don't even care about the kills, though. They're turning right to the bear in less than two minutes after it spawned. Yeah, that is really unfortunate for the side of CCG. Right after we said that Shockey needs to be able to be the tank, be the front line for Lunar, we saw exactly why that can't be the case right now. Absolutely imploded by the Havoc front line. And then they were able to chase down the rest of the team. It will give them the Baron really early on with the pressure that they already have. This is now a very dangerous situation. CCG is going to have to try and ride out the next three minutes, try and keep their base intact, but... Given the pressure that Havoc's put down, I wouldn't be entirely surprised to see CCG lose at least one inhibitor before this timer runs out.
you just have to turtle you have to buy space you have the longer range here so if you can keep havoc outside of the base gates if you can keep them from trying to engage on a fight yeah you're gonna keep losing outer turrets you're gonna lose everything outside of this base but if that's all you lose you're okay shocky's going to get a little bit of gold back taking some turrets in the top side and we've seen the bot inhibitor survives so far the mid inhibitor not really pressured there's not any minions here for havoc to take take that with at least ccg has had a bit of a successful defense here so far they've got 70 seconds left they can handle this baron and if they can keep it this way they'll be in okay shape Yeah, buying time is going the hardest part here. We've seen the resiliency of CCG. Their mental is absolutely strong. As long as they can hold out in-game, they can hold out in team communications. That's not the question here. The question is whether they'll be able to survive fights like this as the top inhibitor is broken right as Baron buff falls off. Oh, man. I think I was muted. <laughs> Yeah, we may have lost you for a moment there. Ah, that's right. You heard me. You heard me in Discord. <laughs> They're like, who is he talking to right now? <laughs> hey, you one. know, I, I hear ghosts, right? Yeah. No, that, you know, uh, yeah, like I was saying, we're still only looking at, you know, six and a half K. So, so not a huge power play. Not a massive difference here. You still got a lead for rain for CS. But when we're looking at just the numbers across the board, two and eight, you're not feeling great. And like I was saying when I was muted, um, it's not like Havoc isn't looking at a late game team as well, right? They have a bunch of late game opportunities. CCG needs to find something, and that's the really difficult part. They have to find an angle on a fight. They have to try to find a pick, but Havoc is playing this one really, really close to their chest. They are moving as units. They're ensuring that anyone who is potentially squishy has got Uni or Cross somewhere there available or Glazer, right, to kind of back them up. So... CCG now is just kind of scattering across the map, looking for a chance to engage. That's also really hard to do with all of the vision that Havoc has layered down across their jungle. Yeah, we're starting to see a little bit of that being cleared out. Slowly, 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 CCG is trying to advance this vision line. But it's difficult, right? Because every time you try and advance vision, you have to wonder, is there a cross in that bush? Will Flocon blow me up from outside of vision here? How safe can I be walking in? And Havoc can just do this. They can just move back through and clear that vision back out. So CCG's going to have to continue to fight for every inch of the rift. They're likely going to lose soul here. There's not a whole lot of way that they can pressure that. But it's Cloud Soul. It's okay. They can keep fighting through. Keep fighting. That's what CCG is good at. Again, never count them out, right? Uh, there have been a lot less fights. This game, though, in in or compared to game number two that we saw yesterday, that there were a lot of deaths at that point in the game, and so with a situation like this, where the item stacking is so heavily in favor of Havoc, any engagement where it's going to be like a five v five situation is not favorable for CCG. It's going to be you know heading towards Havoc. So. Like I said, CCG, it's so difficult to kind of decide where you move forward here. Because like I said, they need to make something happen, but they can't just start a regular engage. They have to find a pick, and nobody is allowing that on the side of Havoc. No, Havoc's done a great job of controlling here. And as we saw there, even with three four members in the area, Uni-13, enough to scare away the vision around the Baron. So Havoc able to clear out that Drake with the other four members, and now, courtesy of Uni, has complete control over this other neutral objective, the Baron. It, 
CCG really going to continue to struggle here. And with a four on five here, Cross is still away for a couple of seconds. Will they find the fight they need? They get the last embrace that we saw, but it's not in time. It's a flash forward. It's the pulling that comes out, and it's Rain who goes down first. Now on the backside, Uni is trying to get the engage. It's a big pop from the Cyclone, but it's not going to be enough, and it's actually a separation here from Shocky and Cross. Shocky trying to say, all right, let me take the trundle out of here, but it's not enough. In the meantime, you get a quadra kill for Uni. Uni says, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking Cross out of the fight so that I can pick up all those kills. Yeah, that... I hate to say it here, Jolly, but that may well spell the end of the game. With 20 seconds left on timers, with a Baron buff that's going to be applied to this Darius any second now, Havoc could come very close to taking the Nexus here before CCG has another chance to save this game. But luckily, um, you know, they... <laughs> There have been well, I few not. enough deaths. There have been few enough deaths in this game. Their timers aren't crazy. And because Havoc didn't just go straight for the Nexus, go straight for pushing a lane, they opted for the Baron. Yeah, they're not going to at least pressure farther into the base, but they've got pressure on the map, right? They've had the top towers down. They've had the, the inhibitor tower um, exposed, and now the inhib exposed for a very long time. So Havoc's more than comfortable saying, all right, we're still kind of playing this slowly. At this point, we're over 10K in the lead at 30 minutes in the game. That's a really good number to be looking at. And when we're looking across on the other side, we're barely finishing up third items. If we even have third items for these members of CCG, whereas we're looking at, you know, four plus for Havoc. Yeah, especially in that top lane, the difference is staggering. Shaki has not completed their third item yet, while Bedarius is nearly full build. Uni, an absolute monster, as CCG desperately trying to hold on to something, trying to keep this bot inhibitor turret alive, but Uni, he's gonna clear out the other two. Doesn't matter. Havoc can contain a 4v5 at this point. And nobody wants to go up to Uni. <laughs> I mean, at this point, everybody is, they're like, we're going to face check the culling before we go up and try to aggress on this Darius. And that's what you have to do. They're just trying to defend this last inhibitor turret that they have. Otherwise, it's really a fully exposed base. And it's going to take more than that to keep Havoc away. They go for the tower. They get a lot of damage down. Flocon almost goes down. And there's the ultimate. It ends up being a kill for Baruto, but that's not where you want the kills to go. And on the opposite side, Sagewabe able to pick up this Wukong with Munchie out of the fight. It looks like this is going to be the end just after 31 minutes into this game. We're looking at a 13K gold lead havoc, really reigning supreme in this first game against CCG. Yeah, that's really unfortunate for CCG. A lot of holes in their gameplay that we really wouldn't have liked to see. The top lane, Shockey, just seemed outclassed as Uni was able to win, both with better map awareness, with better control from his team, and by the end, with better individual play. Uh, Munchie, despite having better early game, being able to get some of that pressure out, couldn't translate it into wins for their team. And you mentioned at the start of this broadcast that you wanted to see Rain really contribute. The Orianna unfortunately fell a little flat here in game one of day two. Yeah, uh, the Orianna fell really, fell really flat. And I mean, when you've got the Orianna pick up, you know, into the Lissandra, that's that's a tough one, right? So I also think I think that you know we didn't actually I think we didn't say Cross's name enough in that matchup. I think Cross did an incredible job from the beginning. Uh, we actually saw early on, Cross was doing kind of what what Munchie was trying to do yesterday and getting these, these aggressive little invades, poking down some damage, uh, taking what you can from the enemy jungle, but it was more actually about the positioning and layering down vision so that they could say, okay, we know where Munchie's gonna be at all times. That way we'll have the upper hand on this one. And it was really good response times coming out of Munchie and the rest of CCG at the start of the game. But as soon as things started to speed up for Havoc, as soon as they locked in their second item before CCG, they really took advantage of that spike in damage, that extra spike. And there just wasn't enough of a front line. There wasn't enough resiliency on the side of CCG to deal with the tankiness and the amount of damage that was stacked up from Havoc. 
yeah, when your tank is being absolutely exploded in the first couple of seconds of the fight, there's not a whole lot that you can do, unfortunately, there. For CCG, though, this is just game one of the day. You can still end the open qualifiers on a positive note. Go three and two, stay on the upper half of the bracket. So they'll get a chance here to rest up, to rethink, and to try and pinpoint exactly what went wrong so that they can make it better in game two of the day. Absolutely. We do have, like you said, two more games to look forward to. As of right now, if I'm not mistaken, it's a rolling schedule. So we may end up starting a little bit earlier, but things are scheduled at the moment. It's 1 p.m. Eastern for the first game, 3 p.m. Eastern time for the second game, and then 5 p.m. Eastern time for the third game. But like I said, if all of the teams finish... Ah, that's all. If all the teams finish early and uh, decide, you know, they agree that they want to continue on in the games, then we're going to start them as soon as we get the go-ahead. So keep an eye on the page. Uh, at the very latest, though, we are going to be starting game number two at 3 Eastern. So we want to see it here. We want to see all is here, too. Hopefully we get him back within that time. We are going to take a break until then, though. So thank you so much for tuning in and supporting CCG. We'll see you here in a little bit.